I'm Batman. I hardly think so. The real Cape Crusader calls his crime-fighting cohorts when he's running late. I have to walk. I couldn't get Raj on the back of my scooter. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Aquaman sucks. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a new program that we have here. So you know that we do tactics Monday through Thursday. Well, we thought it'd be cool to do something on Friday. And since people kind of want to unwind, get away from reality for a little bit, we thought it'd be really cool to do something that kind of focuses more on entertainment and just do some fun stuff for Friday. And so you may remember my friends, Chris and Andrew, they were both with me on the Nerd Herd in the segments that we used to do back on Tactics Radio, and they are back for this brand new segment that we're doing called The Geek In. So welcome to the program, guys. Thanks for being here with us. Hello. Hey. All right. So for our very first episode, sort of the maiden voyage of The Geek In, as it were, we're going to do something that all three of us have been really big fans of for a very long time. We are doing the top ten... And we're doing a top 10 of the best Generation 8 Pokemon. The Tactics Top 10. Okay, so before we get into our list, we've got a couple of rules that we need to go over. First of all, uh, when it comes to this list, the only real rules are that only Gen 8 Pokemon are allowed. So in other words, anything that came before Sword and Shield... They're not allowed in this list. This is a list that exclusively focuses on new additions to the Pokemon roster for this particular game. Now, the only other rule that we did add as sort of a qualifier is that Galarian forms can be included. Since they are technically new Pokemon, they're a reskin of an old one, but still, they're new enough that they're allowed to be counted. And so, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and go to number 10. Number 10. And number 10 on our list is actually a Galarian Pokemon, Galarian Rapidash. Now, this was one that I actually had picked on my list. I just think it fits so well with the theme of the game, of course, being very centric to sort of Great Britain and British lore, sort of that Scandinavian Norse mythology. Unicorns, of course, being a big part of that. I just thought it made perfect sense to repurpose an old Pokemon and do it in this way. Frankly, the design is a little bit too My Little Pony for my taste. But overall, I love the concept. What did you guys think? So it wasn't on my top ten list. It was on yours. Right. I was surprised to see it there because there's a whole lot of pink... That's and true. there's a whole lot of aquamarine, and a pony just doesn't quite seem like your cup of tea. So I was very surprised to see you pick this one. But you know, the thing is, I really, really love unicorns as a concept. I, I agree that that one looks like it came <laughs> off of an eight-year-old girl's lunchbox. So, yes, but the fact that we finally got a unicorn Pokemon was something I was pretty excited about. If you've ever read The Last Battle which is the final book in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia series, one of the main characters is a unicorn, and it's one of the coolest characters in the entire series. So, I, I don't know. I guess I just kind of have a soft spot in my heart for unicorns. I'm just going to say, this appeals to Caleb's brony side. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know Caleb had a brony side until now. I definitely now, so. don't. Neither I, did I. I, I do, I'm not a fan of My Little Pony, but I do love unicorns in general. I was going to say, I really liked uh, Gardevoir, and I liked its typing of fairy and psychic, mm-hmm. and so that's kind of why I liked I didn't really care necessarily for the for the looks of it, but Rapidash being one of my favorite Gen 1 Pokemon mixed with uh, Gardevoir's typing, it just kind of was awesome. You know, it's interesting that all of us did have aspects of Galarian Rapidash that we liked, but it was weird that it was like all stuff surrounding the design as opposed to the design itself. That's probably why it's only 10th on the list. Number nine. And number nine on the list is Scorch. Now, I know that this is one of Chris's favorites, and he's probably mad that it didn't get higher on the list. So, Chris, go ahead and tell us why you liked this one so much. So I just have a thing for bug Pokemon anyway. You know that. Right. Um, but I just think it's a really cool typing combination for one. Because I don't think I don't think there's been a bug fire type yet. 
I think, no, I don't I think, think this so. is the first. Yeah, I think this is the first bug fire, which I think is a really cool combination that they haven't tried yet. Um, the other thing is I just like the visual design, right? I don't think we've seen a centipede. And it has that really cool Chinese dragon look to it, you know, with the kind of the, the fire mustache and everything. Right, the sort of wispiness of it. Yeah, I, I can see that. And right. And I like oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I like the moveset, too. I like how they designed it mechanically in the game. It's kind of a uh, physical attacker. It's got some special moves, I think, that are unique to it. And it's just, I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, one thing that I found fascinating, and I don't want to detract too much from talking about Cinescorch, because I want to get to that in a second, but I found it really interesting that the Pokemon games as a whole have sort of transitioned a lot of fire types to being very physical attackers, which is odd, Mm -hmm. because in the first games they were exclusively special attackers. And so it's amazing to me that they've made such a massive shift to where the type is pretty loaded down with physical attackers as opposed to spiritual or spiritual. Spiritual (laughs) attackers. (laughs) Wrong show. I was, (laughs) I was thinking of nine tails, which is, it, it annoys me that it's a, uh, attack heavy Pokemon when it really makes more sense for it to be special attack. But anyway, yeah, the thing I liked about Cinescorch too, I, I do like the aesthetic of it, but one thing that is really cool is, and, and I think it's probably something that bug type fans really appreciated. They made it not only cover its fire weakness. If you get one with a flash fire ability, it's completely immune to fire which is mm-hmm. actually a really cool dynamic for a, a bug type. Yeah, really good for bug teams, too. This one, I don't even know if this one was on my list. It was not one of my favorites. I just, I mean, I think it's a great Pokemon. I think part of my frustration was running into it and not having counters for the five-star raids. And so a lot of times it would just absolutely own me with those three AI uh, Pokemon trainers. Interesting. So I just ended up hating it. <laughs> so, so you actually didn't like it specifically because it was competitively good. <laughs> yeah, because yes. I lost to it. It kicked my tail too much. <laughs> <laughs> number eight. All right, now number eight on the list is one that I may have been the only one that mentioned it on my list, but I had it so high that it, it had a high score. Obstagoon. I really, really liked Obstagoon. And maybe it's because I'm such a big Kiss fan and it's very obviously ripping off of Kiss. Uh, or maybe it's the fact that I really like that it has this weird kind of special protect move that's exclusive to it. Because the thing I like about Obstruct is, protect is, it's good to catch somebody off guard, but basically you've just wasted a turn. If you catch somebody with Obstruct and they happen to use a physical attack, it also lowers their defense. Which is really cool because now you've not wasted a move, you've actually got one up on somebody and taken no damage in the process. And so to me, that was just enough to, to put Obstagoon pretty high on my list. I I didn't have it very high, if anywhere on my list, but that's mainly because its attacks were already cut in my party. So I didn't really have a chance to use it. Even on my second and third runs through Sword and Shield, I didn't end up using it because, again, other attackers that had better stats and stuff were using those moves. I mean, I think it was a great Pokemon. It was really strong in the game, so... So you just felt it was a little redundant? Yeah, for my teams. Fair enough. Um, One thing that is unfortunate about Obstagoon that I do wish that it did a little better, even though I really like it, is it's, it's been done before, basically. With the exception of the move that I just mentioned, Obstruct, basically its entire moveset you could find in a very similar Pokemon like an Absol. And so I, I kind of see that argument, but I mean, the aesthetic to me was just so great that I, I had to put him on my list. Yeah, it's kind of the same way. It seems like it's kind of a redundant Pokemon. It doesn't really have a any kind of real niche. It's just kind of there. Um, I like the idea of taking some of the starter type, like Rattata type Pokemon and trying to turn them into something more useful late game. You know, because basically you're taking Zigzagoon and you're giving it a useful final form. Right. Um, so I think it was a nice idea. It just didn't really, it was kind of like Andrew, it didn't really fill any role or didn't really beg to be used. Um, so the design your opinion, was opinion, okay. good concept doesn't stick the landing. Yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty good. I think it's fair. Number seven. This was one that I liked, but I didn't actually have anywhere on my list, but I know that you two both did Phalanx. 
And I see yes. the appeal to Phalanx. I think it's a cool concept. I like it. I didn't quite like it enough to have it on my list. But, you know, I think seven is probably pretty appropriate. I, I like the idea of a multiple body Pokemon. I guess that's kind of been done before in a few other iterations, but never quite like this. And uh, one thing that did throw me off a little bit is I was very surprised at the fighting type typing. Uh, I was expecting it to be like some kind of bug or caterpillar or something, and it turned out to be fighting type. The fact that it doesn't have any evolution kind of is a strike against it for me. And I, I like the concept. I like the principle. To me, I just didn't see the appeal to put it in the top 10, but, but why did you guys feel that it did? I, I agree with you. I thought it was going to be like a fighting slash bug type. It just, for some reason, made me think, like, like kind of like a, a caterpillar or centipede or something like that. Hmm. Kind of like, I think back to Mario, you know, sometimes you see so, creatures that kind of have that design. Wriggler was exactly what I thought of yeah. when I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, but I really, I really think the design was interesting because you did have multiple Pokemon making up one Pokemon. And I also, it kind of traces back to my fascination back when I used to watch some of the robot fighting shows. If you remember those from the 90s, oh, where yeah. you would have like the multibots, you know, a bunch of little robots fighting instead of one big one. Yeah, that's actually um, the premise of Big Hero 6, too, so... Yeah, so I thought it was interesting, and I like like the first impression and, and the kind of some of its abilities. Again, you know, it has a unique niche, right? It, and its ability—I forget the ability right now—but I thought it was actually pretty interesting too. I wasn't a huge fan of uh, Phalanx. It may have come in at number ten just because I didn't have anyone to, else to put in the list. Again, redundancy for my team. I already had plenty of fighting Pokemon. Uh, any, I think that both. No, just uh, Zakaya at the end, could use uh, Sacred Sword. Wasn't that right? Yeah. So you already had that fighting move that was coming in at the end of the game, and you knew it was coming if you had, you know, pre-researched it. So you didn't really need another fighting Pokemon. But, and let me tell you, I had one main, main reason I hated this Pokemon. Really? When you walk through the zone that it spawns in, <laughs> some of them walk like this real slow, and then others just chase you out of that hole. And anything that frustrates me that much does not go on my team. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, there's there's a big annoyance factor for you when it comes to picking yes. Pokemon. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because that's the second time we've heard that. All right, so <laughs> that being said, we're going to go to our next one, but this one was interesting because it was a dead-even tie. So instead of going to number six, we actually have a tie for number five. We'll talk about one and then the other. So number five is up next. Number five. And really, there is no right or wrong way to do this, so I just figured I'd go alphabetically. Boltund was tied at number five with Dragapult, so since Boltund comes first alphabetically, we'll talk about him first. I really love Bolton's design. His first form, eh, I like Corgis, and I think Corgis can be really cute, but I, I, I feel like that design was just okay at best, not that great at, at worst. Uh, but by the time it evolves to Bolton, first of all, I really like electric types, and I really like the sort of speedy glass cannon thing that electric types seem to do so well, but Bolton, he's not quite a glass cannon. He has a little more defense and a little more special defense than a lot of your normal run-of-the-mill electric types, and I love the design. I love dogs anyway, and uh, he kind of looks like I don't even know how to describe him, but maybe like a lab. And that's really something that surprisingly Pokemon doesn't have, despite how many Pokemon they've designed at this point. And uh, so I thought that it wasn't redundant. It was kind of fresh, kind of new. And competitively, there's a pretty good use for him. So uh, I, you know, Bolton easily made it pretty high on my list. My favorite Pokemon's Eevee, and this is a dog. Eevee's a fox. I mean, I. I think I played, I put every dog type Pokemon on a team at some point. And so I thought he was great. I mean, and also he's electric. He's got a pretty good base speed. He's pretty hard hitter. I had, I'm with you on the Corgi thing though. I just, if I had known that he was going to evolve into that later on, I would have picked one up, started a game. But See, that's I, funny. I didn't pay that I did much attention. Exactly the same thing. I caught one and like just threw it in a box and forgot about it, and then saw a Bolton ro roaming around, caught it, didn't realize that was the evolved form. <laughs> 
You wouldn't. It doesn't make sense. I mean, it, they don't look anything alike. That is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's Pokemon for you. It's it's about like, you know, slender blue dragon turns into big orange Barney. You know, that's just how <laughs> evolutions work with Pokemon. <laughs> what about you, Chris? What do you think of Boltund? Uh, Yamper was stupid. I didn't give it a chance. <laughs> but even so, even so, we already have Manetric. And I figured it, it was kind of redundant when he thought about Manetric. It's redundant in the sense that, yes, it's also an electric d- dog, but it's not electric yes. when you consider that Magnetric sucks. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is, like, is that. In, in my opinion, because I did think of that when I first saw him, I was like, oh, it's like Manetric, but doesn't look retarded. So... <laughs> You know, I, I like Bolton. So let's talk about our other number five, which is in a tie for him, Dragapult. Now, personally, I didn't really see the draw to Dragapult. You guys both really liked it. And I think that is because we're, even though we're, we're friends and we love Pokemon, we have very different ways of playing the game. Um, I think Dragapult is the best example of Pokemon design happening while someone is on an acid trip. Uh, it's like, dude, there's like this dragon and he's like also a ghost and he shoots like tinier little dragons out of his head. Like who came up with this thing? (laughs) But I mean, I guess there's a lot of people that like it. He's one of the more popular ones in Gen 8. One thing I think Andrew will like is that it's very competitively viable. Yeah, I'm sure Um, that was Andrew's rationale as well, but go ahead. (laughs) my, My biggest thing is that it's just an interesting design. Again, I really like when they do things that are unusual or novel or new. Sure. And if you, if you can't tell from the conversation so far, the ones I haven't liked are the ones that were similar to things that already been done before. And well, so having and, and a granted, dragon, that's hard to do when you have 800 plus Pokemon. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's a difficult I, thing to pull off. So yeah. True. But like having a dragon that shoots other dragons as missiles, I thought was it, weird, but original. It's original. I'll give you that. And it's a dragon ghost type, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah, I think that dragon ghost type could have like been interesting, but I will say that at least based on my observation, and, and you've played with them a little more, so maybe you're, you have some insight into this that I'm just missing. Uh, but competitively, I don't see how they complement each other. Like, ghost type gives you an immunity to fighting, but dragon types usually have high defense anyway. And when it comes to, you know, dragon's weaknesses, ice and fairy, ghost doesn't really offer any coverage from that either. So, like, I I don't get the advantage to having those two types smashed together. That's just me. I think it's it's overlapping immunities, but it's also, I think, a good moveset. Well, going back to what y'all were just talking about, I think uh, with its typing, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was... uh, Neither of those two types are super effective, or will take four times damage because they're the they're tied together. Right. You you like don't have four X with Dragapult. You're correct. Yeah, but I, I actually didn't like his move set. I think that one of the reasons he was competitive is because uh, oh, what's the name of his uh, dragon move that shoots the dragon darts? Dragon darts was so stinking strong, no matter who it hit. Uh, it was just a powerful move. I I think it was. Competitive, too, because it was fast. It was one of the fastest Pokemon that you could get in the game. And I have a hard time even keeping it in the top five for one reason. And it has nothing to do with Dragapult itself, but it's it's previous evolutions. It cannot learn jack squat for moves up until it turns into Dragapult. The rest of the time, it's just kind of just sitting on the team and and gets knocked around. It doesn't. It's just not good enough to be there. But once you hit that Dragapult evolution... Man, it just becomes a beast. And that's one of the reasons I liked it is because when it hit that, it was good. But my, my biggest fault with it, again, is leading up to it, it wasn't like, you know, Charmander could actually still get out there in its first evolution and do damage. Mm. And it also evolved at like level 16 or 18. Dragapult, what, was it Dreepy? Doesn't evolve until, was it 50? I yeah. think. Yeah, it's like it's 50 and then 60 in terms of Dragapult. So that. Seems like a lot of uh, it's almost like Hexorus. Hexorus takes forever to evolve, and I, I'm I'm not a fan of that. And while it's in its lower evolutions, it's not that good. 
it has to be hack source to be good. So, yeah, I think that that's a 100% legitimate complaint and one that I actually agree with. The only thing that I would bring up though is that's kind of par for the course with dragon types. I mean, Dratini and Dragonair suck. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they just do. I like the look yeah. of them. I think that it's a cool design, but their attacks are awful. I don't think it learns a single dragon type attack until like level 47. And that's just kind of the way that dragon types have always been. Um, Heraxis, the one you mentioned, Hydreigon, like they're, they're just all that way. Um, and and yep. so basically they try to follow the, the concept of, yes, this thing sucks and we made it do that intentionally, but if you're willing to put the work in, it becomes really, really good. Uh, but with, okay. with Dragon so Pulse, you book. can't TM any moves. Like with uh, Gibble and Gar was Gabite, whatever the middle form, form is, you can actually TM some of the highest hitting moves in the game to those guys as babies. With... Um, Dragapult, I, and I think this is probably my biggest problem, is that with Dragapult, you couldn't do that. You couldn't oh, TM something that was overpowered and have it Dreepy use it. And I know, that's that's me. I'm a spike. Like, that's that's my gameplay. I want to no, be able to just knock everything out. But. No, it's it's still a completely legitimate complaint. And, uh, you know, one thing that, that I would just add to that uh, is, you know, just because it's tradition doesn't mean it's a good idea. Like, I, I get that it's, you know, the way that dragon types always are, but that doesn't mean that players have to enjoy it. But Number four. And this is one that I really liked, too. It was definitely high on my list. Toxicity. I thought Toxicity, especially the fact that it has the two alternate forms, the sort of amped up form and then the mellow form. Uh, I really liked both of them. I could see myself playing as either. I, I really liked uh, the the variation there. The whole air guitar kind of thing. It's kind of weird, and it's really hard to do the rock and roll theme when you're talking about a bunch of animals, because unlike some other monster games like Monster Rancher or Digimon, Pokemon has pretty much stayed true to the idea that these things are animals. Like in Digimon, doing a rock and roll theme for a monster isn't that hard because you've also got things like angels and androids and different things with Pokemon that becomes much more of a challenge. And I think the fact that Pokemon did it and pulled it off pretty well is kind of cool. Like they, they give a reason why this big toxic lizard thing actually does look like he's air guitaring. And so it's, it's a strange one. It's unique, but I really liked it. Uh, he's one of my favorites. I did not like him at the beginning of the game for that actual reason, but I don't like like um, the the cat one that was the starter, Tor Cat, and it turned into the big boxing cat at the end, Incineroar, I oh, think yeah, it was. That was stupid. But yeah, See, yeah. I didn't like that. And when I saw Toxtricity, I didn't like the way he was going to form, but man, he is on my sh uh, sword team right now and is just a beast. Mm -hmm. Man, that thing, it, it's fast. It's got incredibly hard-hitting moves. It can learn poisoning moves, which are huge for a competition. So I, I absolutely love it now. I think it looks weird going from a like a baby dinosaur into, you know, a maniac. But it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, like I said, though, that's, that's something we've addressed already. Sometimes yeah. the unevolved form just looks awful, and then the evolved form is really cool. Yeah, that one had to kind of grow on me, but once it finally did, I did kind of appreciate it. I thought it was interesting. I, I do like the, the punk rocker thing, and again, the typing I think is really cool. Oh yeah, I love the typing. They, we've never had a... This was really a big generation for poison types. And yep. I think that it's just sort of unavoidable that certain types don't get enough love as others. I mean, there's what 17, 18 types now. And so you're going to have more monsters for, for some types and some games than others. That's un unavoidable. And it kind of felt like poison type was kind of getting left behind and they really wanted to sort of push that with sword and shield. And I think that they absolutely uh, hit the mark. I mean, with Eternus and then also toxicity, I think that that added a whole lot of firepower and versatility to the poison types. Number three. When we're getting into the upper echelon of this list, it had to be ones that all of us liked. Uh, I think you stuffed the ballot box. Right. <laughs> you, I did not <laughs> stuff the ballot box. Keep in mind that... Uh, no, I'm not even going to go into that. So, Surfetched. Surfetched mm. is number three. I don't even have to tell you two why I like this Pokemon. Chris, why did I like this Pokemon? 
Sword. Yes, it has a sword. I mean, again, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about toxicity. The fact that when they, they wanted to do something sort of human themed for animals, that becomes really difficult to do. And you really have to work your creative muscles to get that moving. And having Surfetched do that with the leak and repurposing an old Pokemon Farfetched and, and giving this as its evolution. I mean, I thought that that was just on the money. And it's actually competitively a pretty strong Pokemon, which kind of surprised me. I think they did the same thing that we were talking about earlier with Obstagoon, taking an old Pokemon and trying to make him relevant again. So I really like that they did that. And Surfetched, I think, you know, powerful fighting moves, uh, decent competitively, really cool design, absolutely fits with the, the, the Great Britain English sort of motif of the region. I mean, when you think about England... The first thing you think about are knights in the medieval times, and, and Surfetch just fits that so well. So this is definitely one of my favorites. He wasn't necessarily one of my favorites, but the design was really awesome. I, Farfetch'd was weird. He was just a painter. Uh, this one is pretty awesome. I feel like he it's more of a jousting stick than a sword, but I mean, it is, it's really cool. I, I like that with each... Um, each new continent or area that we go to with every new game, they're starting to put new forms in. Like uh, Alolan Ninetales is one of my favorite Pokemon right now. I don't know what it is about it. I guess Ice Fairy is really good, but I like that they changed. It went in a completely different direction from being fire. And now he was Farfetch'd was normal, right? Normal. Yeah, Farfetch'd originally was a normal type. And so I mean, they take it from normal to... And now, now he's surfetched and he's fighting, so he's complete opposite of what the normal was. And I think that's really neat. I love it. I love the way Pokemon's doing that with Pokemon, just completely changing their original forms into something that's completely opposite of what it is and just bringing it to life again. It's so cool. Yeah, I, I really like the regional forms as well. And I like the fact that most of them so far have not just been palette swaps with a different type. Like they, they've actually put some thought into it and tried to explain why they're different in these different regions. Can we just say it was about time they did something with yes, Farfetch'd? absolutely. And not only did they do something, but they did it really well. Mm -hmm. I love the design. I hated having to figure out how to get it to turn, you know, Farfetch'd to turn into Surfetch'd. Yes, but when I got there, the <laughs> but it was interesting. It was hard, but it was interesting. And they added the leak as a held item. I thought that was really cool. It, there's kind of a Galarian Farfetch too, right? It's not the same in this version either. Right, there is Galarian Farfetch. He has the really big leak, and he's also part fighting. So, right. So I, I thought it was really interesting. I thought they did a really good job. Yeah, and personally, I prefer. The way that they do, because I know that they have Alolan forms and, and Galarian forms for some of the lower evolutions as well. But personally, I think the best way to do that is to have either a Galarian form with a slight modification and then it evolves into something completely different like they did here. Or just the same regular form and then it evolves into a regional form like they did with Marowak. But I like either a very slight change and then that change gets really obvious with a rev with an evolution or it just starts out the same and evolves differently. I know a lot of people like the Alolan forms of, of lower ones. You just mentioned uh, uh, Alolan Ninetales, which of course there's an Alolan Bullpix as well. I think that's fine, but personally I prefer it the way that they did it here with Surfetch. Number two. I don't know if I'm saying this right or not, so you're just going to have to bear with me because Nintendo, for whatever reason, hates voice acting. Zacian? Is it Zacian or Zacian? I have no idea. That's a I'll take your word for it either way. Sword Wolf. We'll go with Sword Wolf. Uh, <laughs> um, so the reason that I like Sword Wolf so much is really kind of the same reason that I like Surfetch so much to a degree. It has a sword. That is pretty much enough reason by itself for me to like a Pokemon. Uh, with a handful of very rare exceptions. But uh, this Pokemon, very heavy hitter. Really, really strong. And one thing that Pokemon did that I thought was really bold, but it wound up working out really well that I appreciated about it, is they created a new mechanic, and then they made their legendary Pokemon, who is the mascot of the game, a killer of that mechanic. Like, 
they specifically made him as a counter to Dynamaxing, which I think is actually really awesome. His sacred sword attack uh, that, you know, is his specialty does double damage to Dynamaxed Pokemon, and he can't Dynamax himself. So he's like, oddly enough, the counterbalance to the main new addition to the game, which I thought was really cool. I, I love the fact that he's a wolf. I love the legendary motif. One thing that Pokemon kind of painted itself into a corner in, and this really reached ahead in Diamond and Pearl, is that they made their legendary Pokemon too legendary. And what I mean by that is, like, it started out, okay, well, the legendary Pokemon in this game are just really rare birds and a genetic experiment gone wrong. And then they moved up to basically the same thing in silver and gold. Uh, and then they moved up to this Pokemon created the land, and this Pokemon created the sea, and this Pokemon <laughs> created the sky. And then by the time you get to the Diamond Brother, like, it created time and space. And I'm like, okay, slow your roll there, Game Freak. And so the fact that they're just really powerful Pokemon that are rare with a backstory, I think that that fits the spirit of what a legendary Pokemon is supposed to be a lot better than a lot of previous iterations. Zacian hits that right on the money. And that's one of the things that I like about him so much. Uh, so I don't think I actually voted for this one, but that doesn't mean I dislike it. I've just, I've never been one ever since maybe after the first two or three generations. Like I, I got legendary fatigue, kind of like you referenced. Right. So I mean, it's there, it's cool. But at this point, I think for me, the legendaries are getting so over the top and complicated. It's starting to feel like, you know, mega Digimon and stuff. And at that point, I kind of lose interest. The, the thing I like about Pokemon is the, the small scale aspect of it, the small critters and stuff, not so much the big guys. So it's cool. I think they did better here than they did in the past few versions. But, you know, for me, the legendaries all kind of look the same after a while. You know, and I'm not being critical, just an observation. That's something that really doesn't surprise me about you because you've always liked playing with the little Pokemon, the ones that you would look at and think, oh, that can't possibly be a powerful Pokemon or something like that. That's one of the reasons you like bug type so much. And so I can kind of see why you're not a big fan of legendaries from that aspect. I thought he was great. It The uh, the joy that I got from playing with both, I'm going to call him Zakayan because, you know, whatever his name is, and Zamazenta, it reminded me of... Uh, Oris when you got to get Rayquaza after you got the other legendary. Like, you thought that that legendary was it. Then you hit the Delta episode, and it was like a whole other section of the game. So you like the post-game aspect of catching. Yeah, oh, it was so cool. Like, diving into that and the history of it. The, the two protagonists were really obnoxious, but the fact that the story didn't end when you beat the uh, Elite Four or whatever that final section is to me that's cool adding more end game content especially uh with the new updates coming up i think that stuff is what draws me to a game more than anything else right now yeah i'm really hoping that that is is true because i also really like post game content and i think that delta episode is a master class in how to do post game content uh this one was just too short like i really liked what was there I just thought it was too short. But if your biggest complaint is I wanted more of it, that's probably a pretty good compliment to the way that you... Yeah, it was played. good. And number one. All three of us voted for this one. All three of us had him ranked pretty high, at least from what I can remember. Corviknight. So I love Corviknight. He not only has a function outside the game as just a, a, a battling Pokemon, he also is the one that is sort of the mascot for the taxi service. That's just a little tribute. It's not a huge deal. Uh, but this Pokemon's design is very simple. It's not overly complicated. It's basically just a large black crow with armor. I mean, that's that's not a very complicated design. And yet Pokemon pulls off that simplicity so well. And even though I do like the design, and, and I do think that they ought to be commended for that, because it is a really cool... Because he's, he's very simple, but he's also very menacing looking. And I actually really like that in Pokemon. Some get, some people like the cute, cuddly-looking Pokemon. Not me. I like the ones that look like they could do some damage. Corviknight not only pulls that off, but it, it can back it up by actually being very competitive. Scar Scarmoki, I think I'm saying that correctly. Uh, 
one of the issues there is that it doesn't evolve, and because of that, the still flying type doesn't really have a lot going for it. This was a still flying type, which objectively, just looking at the numbers and, and calculating how many weaknesses and strengths a typing has, still flying is the best possible typing for a Pokemon. And when it comes to being competitive, Corviknight actually has the power and speed to back that up. And so it's not only a really cool looking Pokemon, it's also a very competitive Pokemon. It's got speed, it's got power, it, it has defense. You can even use it as a tank. So very, very versatile. I mean, just all around, there's no question that Corviknight is definitely one of the best Pokemon in this generation. What do you think about this one, Chris? So just to make sure I'm on the same page, were you trying to say Skarmory? Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's yeah, got a complicated so think, name and I never play with it nor does anyone else so I never bothered to learn the correct pronunciation anyway okay. go ahead. <laughs> um, I think the word you're looking for is clean I think the design was very clean it wasn't overly complicated I, I did detract a little bit of points because like you said skarmory has been done steel flying's already been done but Going back to the Obstacoon discussion, I like that they're taking the early level guys and turning them into something useful late game. Because you, if you remember in the first, in the earlier games where you had to have someone that knew flying and in game, you would often start with like a Pidgey or something like that, and it never really would get that much better. But adding the steel typing makes it really good. Yeah, it's I think very strong. Howling Flames, the only example I can think of where they did something like that. But I, I agree with your point. Right. And so, yeah, doing that, I think, is is good. I think it's a good idea. I like the design. I think it's pretty strong. Um, so, yeah, the typing has been done before, but I, th I still think it's a good design. For me, it just came down to the competition aspect. It was by far the most competitive Pokemon at the start of the game. Like, when it first released, that was, like, the number one that you could have in your uh, team. Uh, the typing, I think it's cool. Uh, I forgot about Skarmory, to be honest, until you said something about it just now, but... <laughs> See, I'm not uh, the only one that thought it was useless, so go ahead. <laughs> I I've never used it uh, in, in trading cards or on the game, uh, but for me, it was just, if you've ever had... Like, if you haven't used it before, you're crazy. But to get one and you breed it with something that has Roost, when you get that combination yeah. and you have six perfect IV Pokemon, that Pokemon is unstoppable. It can You can use Iron Defense twice, take on even special attack hits. Even though that just boosts physical, it still has a bulky enough special attack defense to take hits from specials as well. You use Roost once, it doesn't put you to sleep like Rest does, and then you hit it with either the flying move, or uh, a lot of people use that really strong fighting move, and it took out everything. I mean, it was just so powerful. Yeah, and so I, flyers are unusual. Yeah, that, that's why I liked it. It was it was super competitive, and you could, and I'm not just talking about PvP. It was competitive in the game. You could put it up against pretty much anything that was in the game and you could take it on. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting, though, that one thing that Chris kind of alluded to earlier, it's funny that we all remember back in earlier Pokemon games where you had to have a flying Pokemon because you had to get around. And one of your Pokemon had to have the HM fly for you to be able to dart around the... Uh, around the map whenever you wanted to and it's funny that uh, we finally have one that is ultra competitive and you don't need it anymore because it does fly you around but you don't have to have it in your party to do so so it's kind of funny Game Freak finally figured out that formula after it was no longer necessary <laughs> so I think actually I think that's why it's the perfect timing for it you think so? yeah so, so basically, like, you no longer have a motive uh, in having to have a flying Pokemon, so we're going to give you one that's awesome that you'll want to have in your party anyway. Right, it earns its keep. Okay, I, I can see that argument. All right, so that's it for our top ten this evening. I want to go to closing thoughts. Guys, and, and I'll be the one to close out, but I want your thoughts on this. What did you think about the Pokemon design overall compared to other generations? Chris, go. Uh, I thought it was... I thought it was interesting. I thought they did do a couple of unique things. I think they could have done a little more. I think they could have been a little riskier because they still did some pretty safe, repetitive, or redundant designs. But 
the ones that were unique and interesting were really unique and interesting. Okay. What about you, Andrew? Where, where did you think, where did you fall on this compared to other generations and their monster design? I think that they're running out of things. And so my opinion on it's kind of bleak. Uh, I, I wasn't a huge fan of a lot of the new stuff, but they're, they're, as we continue on, like we only had how how many two hundred Pokemon or something like that in the initial release, and not many of them were new. It was just a bunch of repetitive stuff. I think that I would personally like to see more of those cool typings, like Dragon Ghost or uh, Grass Lightning, something like that. I would like to see a lot more of those than some of the repetitive solo uh, typings. That's fair. Um... I kind of fall somewhere in the middle because I actually compared to other generations, at least I felt that this was a fairly strong showing. I'm not going to say that it was one of the best slate of po- new Pokemon that we have. And to be honest, when I initially saw it, when I saw the release before the game came out, I thought a lot of them were dumb and some of them are dumb. I mean, like frozen electric chicken, whatever that thing is. I, I mean, think that's stupid. Yeah, that's Actually, just thing. I, I don't know who thought that was a good idea. Also, um, I was severely disappointed in the fossil Pokemon. Yeah, that's true, because you really yeah. like fossil Pokemon. And I they, love they did fossil Pokemon. These job with these. Super disappointing. But anyway, so I mean, just like every generation of Pokemon, there's some designs that are just not good. Uh, but I will say, I think that this may be the best slate of new Pokemon we've had in a while, because... Even though I didn't even vote for every Pokemon on this list and and some of the other ones that we didn't get to mention, Frozmoth, Rillabloom, uh, Eternus, Zamazenta, um, I really liked a lot of these. And it's become pretty commonplace for me to, when a new Pokemon game comes out, just play with a lot of older Pokemon. I had about half my team with new Pokemon this time. And so I think the designs were actually pretty good compared to a lot of past uh, renditions. I didn't think that Sun and Moon had a very strong showing. Uh, I think that Black and White, even though I really love Black and White as a game, most of the new Pokemon on that one just were kind of subpar. To a great degree, the same thing with X and Y as well, so... Uh, th- this may be the strongest slate of new Pokemon we've had since Diamond and Pearl, in my opinion. But, you know, I don't think that it's way superior by a level of degrees, but I think they did a pretty good job with this one. All right. Well, thanks, guys. We appreciate you being with us this evening. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. In the meantime, stay the course, friends. <laughs> Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.